Hope you had a good time so far. And our keynote speaker today is Karen Sandler. Um, she'll be talking about companies, free software, and you. Karen is the uh, executive director of the Software Freedom Conservancy, and she used to be the um, executive director of the GNOME Foundation. And she's also um, working a lot on, on the outreach program for women and several other programs, I guess. So everybody, please welcome Karen. Thanks so much. I am. I can't even tell you how beyond excited I am to be at DevConf. I was like briefly at the New York DevConf, um, and I was like so impressed and enthralled by Debian that I kind of ran away. <laughs> um, and so all these years later, I, it's so exciting to be here and uh, and being a, a speaker. Um, so. Uh, I'm executive director of Conservancy. Raise your hand if you've heard of Conservancy. So that's almost everyone, hooray. Um, we're we're a, a, a nonprofit a charitable a fiscal sponsorship organization. So these are all of our member projects. Um, if you're here, you are surely using a few of them. Um, and uh, uh, two of the member projects that are not uh, listed here include the uh, GPL Compliance Project for Linux kernel developers and also the Debian Copyright Aggregation Project. And I'll talk a little bit about those in a bit. Um, so I'm, I'm also a lawyer, which when I admit, I often have to hide behind the podium. <laughs> Less people throw rotten fruit at me. But, uh, but I only do uh, pro bono legal work. Uh, and I do, you know, I do that as a volunteer for uh, the Free Software Foundation and GNOME and a few other free software organizations. Um, I am really, really into free software, and uh, and the reason why I'm really into free software, for many reasons, but uh, but largely because I'm a cyborg. <laughs> um, I have I actually literally have a big heart. Uh, my heart is three times the size of a normal person's heart, and it's fine. Um, I'm mostly asymptomatic. It's not a big deal, but I'm at a very high risk of suddenly dying. The um, the medical term is actually sudden death, um, and uh, and it's two to three percent uh, per year uh, compounding that uh, my risk of suddenly dying. And I was diagnosed at age thirty, and so it's like a very high risk of suddenly dying. But uh, it's all fine because my uh, doctors prescribed a pacemaker defibrillator, um, and uh, when they like when you go to the doctor's office and they tell you that you need one of these things, they like, uh, the electrophysiologists have like these devices in their desk drawers. So the medical device companies give them like a stack of them. They're extremely expensive. I got the bill for mine. It was, I think it was something like $75,000 um, US. Um, and so they, they have them in their drawer. They slide them over to you um, because they want you to hold them and to know that they're so small and they're so light and they're not scary. And so they're like, you know, hold this. So I, I take it and I hold it and I'm looking at it and the, the doctor's looking at me like, right, this is okay, right? And I say, okay, so what does it run? <laughs> and the, the guy looked at me and said, run? And I said, oh yes, and I explained there's software in this device. And uh, we had a little back and forth and he said, well, don't worry about it because I'm gonna, you know, go get the representative from Medtronic who you're so lucky is in the office today. And that guy said, software, run? Um, and this, this set me down a path where I started researching the safety of software in these devices. And um, it, you know, I was able to luckily make it a part of my job and, and, and did a bunch of research. And ultimately, um, I decided that I had to get this defibrillator um, and get proprietary software literally <laughs> implanted in my body and screwed into my heart. Um, and, uh, and, and that I would advocate for software safety. And when you start looking at your own mortality and your own life and you realize that you rely on software that you can't see, that you, you, know, you can't review, you can't get anybody else to review it. If there's a problem, you can't patch it. Um, and we're still, societally, this is the problem. We're locked into single vendors. If, um, you know, if we have a problem with our, um, you know, if, there, if there's a, 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 a catastrophic failure at one of these medical device companies, then we're out of luck. If I can't update my defibrillator and it is a problem, I have to wait until Medtronic, well, I'm picking on Medtronic, but I, 
I, I chose them because I thought they were the best of the bunch. But I have to wait for Medtronic to admit that there's a problem for them to you know, make a fix, to deploy that fix. I'm completely powerless. And once you start thinking about your medical devices in your heart, it's not a long walk to get to cars, which a luxury car is like 100 million lines of code. And the Software Engineering Institute in, uh, estimates that there's one bug introduced for every 100 lines of code. So even if we're catching the vast majority, um, medical device recalls have been um, have demonstrated that uh, things, simple things like all pairs testing would have avoided 98% um, of the software recalls in medical devices. It's all really fascinating. It's a whole talk in and of itself. Um, but for me, this got me extremely passionate about software freedom, where I previously thought that open source was cool. I have now come along to the view that software freedom is absolutely essential to our lives, to our society, um, and to our overall framework. And that has put me solidly in the free software space. And I am lucky that I get to work on the charity side. So the Software Freedom Conservancy um, is a 501c3 that's a, a reference to the US tax code. Extremely geeky. And you get a lot of people in our space who know all about the different tax codes and will rattle off numbers to you. It's like uh, the same people who rattle off sections of the GPL at you who <laughs> tell you which sections those are. Um, so C3 refers to the US tax code, um, and it's a charity. And there are analogs in, um, you know, in, in, in every country. Has, um, most of them have like, different kinds of charitable organizations versus um, uh, you know, a trade association, which in the US is a C6. So you'll hear people say, it's a C3, it's a C6. C3 charity, C6 trade associations. We've got companies. Free software is developed in a wide variety of ways in a wide variety of organizations. And all of these organizations are working together um, on a lot of the same goals, but with extremely different motivations. Um, if you look at all these different um, areas, you can sort of start to contemplate how that might to start to play out. Um, and in this talk, I'm sort of focusing on the, the company element, because I think that's uh, you know, we're sort of at a point of maturity in free and open source software where we're able to, um, to see what's happened over a longer period of time and, and start to look forward and how that impacts us. Um, we will move forward. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I think it's so awesome that companies have an interest in free software. Raise your hand if you're making money by working in free and open source software. It's like, Three quarters of the room. Um, I did notice that John Sullivan of the FSF was <laughs> raising his hand, too. <laughs> and, and I should raise my hand too because I, I do make, take a salary from Conservancy. Um, and uh, but but the company interest in in free and open source software is fantastic because it means we all get to work on the like making sure that there's great free and open source software that uh, companies use in their products. Um, it, it works out well for a lot of reasons, um, and. Um, and I think that, uh, in fact, it's essential that companies be interested in free and open source software because it takes free and open source software to another level. And it means that free and open, like, it means that free software is doing something right if the software is so good that companies are deploying it in their products and it's now an essential part of the software that companies need to be relevant and to, um, and to bring their products to market. Um, and it's great that there's money in free and open source software because Everyone needs to eat. And on top of that, we can do a lot more when there are people working full time on, um, on these issues. And when companies are employing those people to work in free software, there's, um, there, there are interesting things that happen. So um, this works out some of the time. It works out um, where companies employ people to work in free software, and great work is done, and everybody benefits from it. There's uh, companies have. Um, you know, increased software to draw from. Um, companies work together um, where they're allies in some ways and competitors in others. Um, and it's very interesting. This is a slide from the Linux Foundation uh, uh, brochure. It might be, I, they may have updated it since then. But, uh, but it sort of says all of the places where Linux is. And you can kind of appreciate like how, how much money there is in free software and how, um, and how relevant um, Linux is generally for the, the Linux kernel. Um, but when you start to evaluate uh, 
or GNU Linux. Um, when I, when, I, when, I, uh, when you start to evaluate the, um, you know, these, uh, the presence of um, companies in free software, you start to feel the boundaries of where we say, like lawyers say, our interests are aligned. Like when we're talking about people who have different motivations or interested in different things, but who, um, but who are working together. And so their interests are aligned. And so you can see how the free software community and society's interests are often aligned with companies. But when you start to think about it closely, you start to get to the borders and boundaries of where those interests are in fact aligned. And during that introductory panel yesterday about open hardware, we started to touch on it. And, um, and, and uh, Andy was talking about uh, a particular um, product where the product was effectively bricked because the company who had sold it had turned off the services to it. And, um, and Bedell was talking about how, you know, in an internet of things, we, we really need open standards and companies need to, you know, we, we need to make choices where we can work together so that the efforts that we make individually extend to everyone. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that was sort of starts to really hit it on the head. And I think that as we think critically about the role of free software in society or the role of free software in companies, we hit against this idea very, very quickly. Um, uh, Edward Snowden gave a, a, a really amazing uh, keynote Q&A at Libra Planet, and there he said, uh, while sometimes corporations are on our side and sometimes stand up for the public interest, we should not have to rely on them. And that's, that's the thing, is that companies can do the right thing. You know, they can have societal interests at heart, but it's not their goal, it's not their job, it's not what they're set up for. They're set up to maximize profit. And there are ethical rules, and different countries have different rules about things that companies can do. Um, and I don't want to overly dramatize it because I, I, I'm not, you know, I, I'm, I wouldn't, you know, I don't think that anyone can say that companies are, are you know, are evil. There, there could, in extreme cases, be some evil people working at a particular company. But these things are much more complex. It's just that companies have the goal of making profit, and they're not necessarily looking out for the public interest. And in fact, they often have incentives such that they're not focused on the public interest at all. Um, how, raise your hand if you've heard of Volkswagen and the scandal that happened recently. I think that's probably everybody. OK, raise your hand if you've heard about uh, VMware and the lawsuit against them. So that's like, OK, like three quarters. OK, so I, I chose these two companies, not because they both begin with the letter V. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, but so, uh, so the Volkswagen scandal, which I, I don't think I need to go into, I think everybody raised their hand, uh, uh, was very interesting because you know, it's, it's a, it, it was a, a part of, of, of technology where if, you know, if the engineers in-house like that were working with VMware had felt empowered to raise the issue much, much earlier, you would see that actually Volkswagen would have done better profit-wise too. Right? It's a very interesting situation because, uh, you know, there was this, you know, having this uh, this this scandal, and some some of the people knew that this was happening, and uh, the corporate culture was such that it was more in. They determined it was more in Volkswagen's interest to keep this quiet, hoping they wouldn't be caught. And comp corporate interests sometimes point in that direction, whereas if there's there okay well I'll get to that in point but uh, but VMware <laughs> VMware is is very interesting because uh, so for people who didn't know and there were about a quarter of you who didn't uh, one of the things that we do at the Software Freedom Conservancy is that we have a um, a group of kernel developers who hold copyrights in um, their portions of the Linux kernel and they um, come together as a group within Conservancy to have us enforce their copyrights. And so we go knocking on companies' doors and we say, hey, you're, you're, you've, not, you've got no source um, with your product and no offer for source. Can you do something about it? And we have a lot of uh, back and forth about that. We also um, now have the uh, Debian Copyright Aggregation Project, which, uh, which does a similar thing for Debian. And, uh, and VMware was a company that we had tried to get to, into compliance for four years. And while they had uh, made significant progress towards 
um, doing the right thing and having compliance. At the end of the day, uh, they put their foot down and said uh, that they, uh, they basically didn't agree with the derivative works provisions of the GPL as how it related to VMware, and they refused to comply. And so uh, Christoph Helwig filed a lawsuit that Conservancy funded um, in Germany, and that's starting to uh, uh, unfold, and it's, uh, it'll be interesting to see where, uh, where that uh, case lies. But all of these things point towards the motivations of companies with their use of software and how that might be different from what uh, you know what the community might want, um, and one of those ways that that plays out in a very fundamental way is the time scale at which companies are acting are often more concerned with their quarterly results than they are about their long term results, and so they're going to be highly motivated to to look a little bit more short term. As opposed to, there are some companies that think very strategically about the long term, um, but overall, corporate culture has become one. Global corporate culture has become one, such that companies are really trying to maximize their quarterly results. And what makes a, a good short to medium term decision for a company is often not at all what's good for um, you know what's good for society, or even what's good in the long term interests of customers, because companies don't necessarily care if you'll be a customer of theirs in 10 years. They care more that you'll continue tomorrow and next week and next month. Especially in technology where it's very hard to predict where technology might go um, within the next year or two. Um, there are a lot of ways in which companies don't necessarily have your interests at heart that are not necessarily nefarious. So for example, you know, I have this pacemaker defibrillator. Um, I am not in the standard set of people who get pacemaker defibrillators. Um, still, I'm young enough that that's still true. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, I was recently pregnant. Um, and when I've been pregnant, I've been shocked twice inappropriately by my defibrillator. Um, because my heart was doing something that a normal pregnant woman's heart does. Pregnant women often have their hearts race. Um, and my pulse shot up. and. Uh, and I got shocked twice, even though I was not in need of a shock. Um, and, and simply put, I couldn't expect Medtronic to be focused on my use case. Because for example, when I went to my, um, my obstetrician in New York City at a major hospital where the high risk doctor surely saw thousands, I mean, she was a senior in her career, she's a great doctor. And you know, I said, you know, there were a couple of things that I said to her, like, you know, if you have patients with defibrillators, you should know that if they get an epidural, you it reminds you of getting shocked. You know, you should know this for your future defibrillator patients. And she looked at me and she said, Karen, I don't have defibrillator patients that have babies. <laughs> like, I don't, like, I don't have, I, the, you know, I had one other patient in all of my years, like five years ago, who had a defibrillator, who had a baby in my hospital. And... You know, it's just simply the class of people who have defibrillators and the class of people who have babies overlap very little. And so Medtronic as a company doesn't have a strong sample set to work with. They're not focused on the use case. I promise you that Medtronic does not want their pregnant patients being shocked. <laughs> like, they have a strong interest in making sure that pregnant women with heart conditions are not inappropriately shocked. But nonetheless, I was shocked because the the... the company simply wasn't focused on my use case. And this can happen in many ways, and it's hard to predict the ways in which you're using software that was written for one purpose, how you might be using it for a, a use case that wasn't anticipated. And, and this is true across the board. And the, you know, my, my health condition is just sort of a metaphor for all the ways we use software. When you move from one geographic region to another, communities have different needs, and they have different cultures, and they use software very differently. Um, and then you could have a whole other, we could talk a, a lot, and I, I hope that we do um, in, informally about how um, improving diversity in our communities helps us um, deal with that a little bit more by anticipating use cases across uh, cultures and uh, across expectations. Um, so that's sort of that's sort of one way um, that there's sort of a mismatch. Um, you know, how many people here think that uh, free and open, like free software and open source software, are the same thing? Raise your hand if you think it's not a trick question. Like really, whatever you think, like if you think it's the same thing, raise your hand. How many people think they're radically different things? 
or different things. Okay. So okay. So it's interesting. So more people thought they were very different things than thought they were the same. But there were a lot of people who were undecided. And I can tell you that maybe like five years ago, maybe more, I was on a real um, advocating uh, bent to convince people that it really didn't matter what we called free software and open source software. It didn't matter what we called it as long as we were talking about freedom. And if you look, the definition, the, the four freedoms and the open source definition line up pretty well. There are a few very historic uh, situations where, the, where there are licenses that are, are approved by OSI but not, a, not considered free um, by the, not on the free uh, software foundations uh, list. But generally, the, what, what they're talking about in principle are the same thing. And so I think that from a legal perspective, we could use the terms interchangeably. But with the perspective now that I've had of watching, um, you know, watching companies in our space a little bit more, I actually feel a little bad about the glossing over that I had done because the motivations that are represented by the terms free, so even if it's not a legal description of licenses, the motivations that people assign when they talk about free software versus when they talk about open source software are very interesting and very different. Has anybody here seen the <laughs> Silicon Valley? Some people have apparently. Okay, so like the, everyone who's seen the TV show Silicon Valley was laughing very loudly. <laughs> so not very many people in here. There's this TV show in the United States called Silicon Valley. It's hilarious. It's about the like startup culture in Silicon Valley in California. And there's this company called Huli. Um, which is like a, a, an analog to Google, and it's just a big, but it's like an amalgamation of different companies. And in the first season of the show, everywhere they go in Silicon Valley, people are talking about making the world better through whatever startup idea they had. And there were posters everywhere making the world better through blah de blah de blah de blah de blah. When actually they weren't making the world, trying to make the world better, they were just using that language. And when I first saw that on TV, my jaw dropped. I was like, wait, that is our rhetoric. And we've been using that in software freedom to talk about making the world better. And it's been completely co-opted by companies who are also active in our space, who may also be, to some extent, making the world better, but co-opting that message so strongly that it's now a joke. Like it's now a completely, it's such a joke that everywhere in this show, there's like, it, for the entire season, it, it was somebody you know, but the, you know, we are raising our Series A, but the important thing is we're making the world better. <laughs> like, um, and, you know, it, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting to sort of like take a hard look at, you know, and it, it actually threw me through a loop because I thought, wait, am I trying to make the world better through software freedom really? Or have I completely lost the plot? Because this is my, you know, this is, this is what I've been saying. And is that true? And, uh, and, I think I sort of have come out at the other end of saying, well, actually, this is, this is residual from, from a very good job that the free software community has been doing of making companies feel welcome and making them feel empowered and good about the choices they make by investing in free software. And that there's a lot of, there are a lot of good things that are related to this that we can continue to increase. But we have to be very wary of who are, what our motivations are and who's selling us what so that we know how we can interact with them and what we should do as partnerships. And I can tell you that undertaking GPL enforcement, completely eye-opening to see what companies do and how they really think about free software. Because when you ask them to comply and they're out of compliance, when you ask them to re release their you know, proprietary kernel models, the answers you get are not about making the world better. <laughs> I promise you. <laughs> um, and so, you know, we need, we need companies. We need to work with them. Free software won't be relevant. We won't win. We won't, I mean, win, whatever that means. We won't, we won't be relevant. We won't really make the world better if we don't also have companies participating and contributing. And companies have a lot to add um, with their own perspective. But we need to do it on our own terms. And we need to sort of, as a community, take more ownership of that and, and, um, and, and be more of a participant in that culture. Um, so, I'm naturally an optimist. Like by nature, I'm a very like I really think the best of people and I think the best of companies. I think the best of the world. I, you know, I I I've been accused of being a bit of a Pollyanna at times. However, as a lawyer, I 
there is nothing about being a uh, being trained to be a lawyer except being trained to be a pessimist <laughs> and expect to expect absolutely the worst of everyone and you have to expect that situations will go bad and you have to expect that even though you're working positively with a company today that tomorrow that relationship might go south and it might be because the people who are in ownership or running the company have had incentives to change their goals, but it could also just simply be that the company has been acquired or that leadership has changed completely. You can't expect that um, a company that is a good actor today will be a good actor tomorrow. Um, and it's, again, not to say you should be unreasonably suspicious, but you need to plan for the worst case scenarios no matter what. And this is why we have lawyers and this is why we have legal regimes. Um, and what it's really about is it's about power and it's about a power balance. And what's, um, what's one of the things that's really cool about free and open source software is that we have some legal regimes that are sometimes in place to help keep that balance of power. And the GPL is a fundamental mechanism for keeping that balance of power with companies, um, keeping that balance of power with each other, and also keeping that balance of power in check with developers and with society in general. Um, and so this is a, a, a like a, just a copy heart uh, logo uh, with the GPL. Um, but as you may have noticed, some people have sort of like in the last five to ten years, um, lax permissive licensing has really taken hold, and it's been a real. I mean, if you see some real vigorous nodding in the in the audience, um, and and I, I think a lot of that has to do with not the original emphasis on lax permissive licensing, not the original freedom emphasis from the BSD communities, that cultural <coughs> insistence on, on a pure kind of freedom that, you know, where, where folks thought that the, um, that the GPL was too restrictive, right? And that the only way of having true freedom was to have the ability to proprietize it. And that, you know, as a concept of freedom, I think that has actually shifted, and it's, it's not the reason why, um, why in the last 10 years that last permissive licensing has become so popular. It's become so popular because companies have been messaging so strongly that the only way you can get your software adopted is by using a lax permissive license. And people have bought this so wholeheartedly. It's so fascinating to me because we had so much success with Linux under the GPL, and there are certain accomplishments, like the, the technology gets to a place with the GPL that you wouldn't necessarily be able to get to otherwise. And that they're, you know, and, and uh, Linus Torvalds, for example, has publicly said that the biggest contribution he made um, was not any technological contribution, but instead the license choice uh, behind the Linux kernel. And so we have, we have a real, we're really out of balance on this because we've gone very strongly as a society towards um, non-copy lefted software. And um, this has upset sort of the balance of what we can expect from companies. And I thought it was very interesting. This is uh, Martin Fink uh, of uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprises um, at the last LinuxCon Europe. He gave a talk and he said, we need to change the default back to copy left from permissive licensing. And, um, and he gave a lot of really interesting business-minded reasons why it's good for business that this is the case. He said that you know, what happens is if you choose a non-copyleft license, you have to introduce all of this governance and infrastructure to make sure that companies play fairly with one another. And it's expensive, and it's artificial, and it sometimes breaks down. But, um, but from our perspective, I think that from a, a, a community project, from a community perspective, I think his message of change the default has a whole you know, additional power to it. And I thought like, you know, hearing somebody who is coming from such a corporate perspective um, echo, um, echo within a corporate uh, construct what I think that we need to do more as a society, you know, as a society and a community it was, I think, extremely powerful. And so if somebody tries to tell you that if you're starting a new project, that you will only find success and popularity by using a permissive license, it's simply not true. And it's, again, trading those long-term versus short-term goals. Maybe you'll get some companies to adopt it a little bit sooner, but down the road, 
your project is, is potentially going to be forked by another company and you won't be able to see any of those changes and you'll be completely locked out of the relevant um, part of your software. So um, this is something to think about. Um, and enforcement, basically, without enforcement, there is no copy left effectively. You could choose a license until you're blue in the face. But if there's not anyone who's going to enforce it at the end of the day, you may as well have never made that choice to begin with. Nobody is going to take you seriously if there are no consequences to you know, uh, not following the rules. Um, but having centralized power can really, really frustrate that balance. So if you have one company that, so if it's, for example, a strong copy left license, if it's an AGPL or a uh, you know, GPL program, but it, all the copyrights are owned by a single company, then you have a, a power balance. And the fact that the software is under a copy left license helps, but it doesn't get you um, all the way to, that, uh, to that, that great balance. And in many ways, Debian really has the best of both worlds. Because with Debian, it's such a big project, and there are copyrights that are so diversely held, no one could aggregate those copyrights, even if they tried. But we don't necessarily want to, because having a project that's held diversely is extremely powerful and helpful. It keeps, it keeps these power balances much more in check. Um, but at the same time, um, uh, Debian's, Debian has set up the copyright aggregation program with Conservancy. And so we will aggregate copyrights for people who are interested in doing so. And that way, we can help. Um, if there is a violation, it's easier to pursue it. Because if you have a diversely held project and there's a violation, who's going to be the one to knock on the company's door? They're not going to take any one developer seriously um, enough because it's such a small amount of code. So if we aggregate it together, it means that not only do we empower a single steward that's going to be helpful, um, but it also uh, enables someone with a single voice to be able to, to sort of speak for enforcement to make sure that the right thing is done for the project. Um, we also, uh, to respect the, uh, the diversely held copyrights, we also now take enforcement agreements so that if people don't want to have their copyrights enforced, we can do enforcement agreements in addition to just plain old copyright stewardship. And so it's sort of, in many ways, it's the best of both worlds. I mean, I think that a lot of the things that Debian has done has made it a, such a unique community. Um, I think that uh, uh, the way that, uh, that there are so many developers that are so independent and the way you come together and elect a single DPL is a amazing and unusual thing. And I think is the reason why the Debian community has weathered the time so well, um, even though many companies are building on Debian for their products. The Debian community stays so strong and so independent, and it's so interesting, and it's so unique. Um, another thing that um, I think we all need to pay attention to that can help tip that balance is with our employment agreements. How many people here have an employment agreement in place for what they're working on now? Wow, that's so low. It's like only like a quarter of the people in here. I, I bet many of you actually have employment agreements that you don't realize that you have. I, I don't think one. I'm <laughs> uh, so, uh, so, uh, I, so I'll be, move a little bit faster on this, which is to say that when you take a new job at a company, you will be generally asked to sign an employment agreement. And those employment agreements have been getting stronger and stronger and stronger over time. And they often ask for the world. They ha basically tell you that everything that, or, or agree that everything that you do, either not just within the context of your job, but at all during the time that you're employed is owned by your company. The, and the type of illegal in Germany. Yeah, so their different jurisdictions have, some have <laughs> so, some checks and balances, but the lines on that aren't necessarily as clear as you think that they are. So it's really, um, it's all very, very fascinating stuff. But in any case, making sure that you have an agreement with your employer about working on free software is important. And making sure that you negotiate that and ask for more is, is, uh, is essential. So we at Conservancy are working on a project where we're publishing um, standard contract language. So you can say, I would like you know, provisions 1, 3, and 5 when you negotiate with an employer. And they can say, oh, we never take 5, but maybe we take 1 and 3 <laughs> occasionally. Um, and we're working with some companies so that they can re they will review it. And they, they'll say, we may never take this, these provisions. Like, we may never let individuals hold their copyrights, but if we do, they, the language looks like this. But asking companies if you can hold your own copyrights, some people do negotiate it. And some of those, I admit, are rock star developers, but some are not. And if we all ask 
for it. If everybody who, if like all, a lot of the talented developers that, um, that a company seeks to hire ask to keep their copyrights um, or asks for the freedom to work on free and open source software that's um, you know, outside of their job, if, if we all ask for it, then it, some companies will start to bend because they'll see it as a feature for recruiting talent. And together, we can make a huge difference in the culture of the space and the bargaining power. Um, some people are advocating for like unionized free software development, uh, which is a very interesting notion. But, uh, but I think that uh, I, I, it's sort of from a, a plain old normal way, I think it, it would be very interesting if we all started to ask about, um, about keeping our own copyrights and other provisions. So we're working to enable people to do that. Um, Support the charitable nonprofits. You know, think about, it's very self-serving. So I know people are laughing. <laughs> or, or, or Keith is laughing. <laughs> but, but, uh, but, but having, but, you know, it's, it's not just the conservancies, it's the SPIs, right? It's all of the, it's, it's and now, and now BDAL's nodding. <laughs> Um, you know, it's supporting the charitable structures around free and open source software because they are they are what are going to enable us to keep the interests of the community and the interests of society at heart. And um, you know, the Free Software Foundation, SPI, Conservancy, we're, we're organizations that have a mission to support free and open source software um, for freedom. And so, keeping the charitable organizations strong is really essential. And Conservancy, in the last uh, last year shifted its, uh, it's been last year shifted its business model. So we're now individually funded primarily rather than company funded. And we've found that it's enabled us to be focused more on the programs that are important to community and important to society. And if we were funded by companies, if we were a trade association, we could never do that in the same way. And it's not that trade associations don't do good work and it's not that they, they can't also be doing things in the public good. It's just, it's not their focus. Um, and so I would say, really, like you're all so awesome for being at DevConf and for being involved in the Debian community. And Debian is so unique and so focused on freedom. So stay focused on freedom. It's the most amazing thing. And um, together, we can make the world better and not in an ironic, hilarious way. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm happy to announce that, uh, that due to a, a generous donation by an anonymous donor, anybody at DevConf, who signs up as a Conservancy supporter, will be matched. Um, so it's a really good time if you're, I don't want to give a sales pitch, but, uh, but, but it's a good time um, because, uh, because uh, uh, someone who's here who cares passionately about software freedom is going to give this, uh, to match that donation. Anyway, so does anybody have any questions? Do we have time for questions? Thanks, Karen, for okay. that talk. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> We started a bit late, so we have time for a few questions. Thanks. Okay, so my, my question goes Hi. more. Uh, Is it on? Yeah. My question goes more like uh, being pulled by what uh, what, uh, what Abba said. Uh, uh, you mentioned a lot of work from uh, from uh, from the software uh, freedom conservancy. And well, benefits uh, 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 regarding the work that uh, you are doing, but uh, in a community such as ours, uh, does does the, uh, do you uh, have or do you work with uh, similar groups not focused in, in the U.S. Because I mean, yeah, the, the the rules are different everywhere, and I'm I'm sure it would be very hard for you personally to litigate here or whatever. Yes, I am a, I'm a U.S. lawyer admitted to practice in the state of New York and not anywhere else. <laughs> this is not legal advice and I am not your lawyer. <laughs> however, <laughs> however, free software is global. Um, you can't simply have a U.S. focus and, and work in free software. So we're, we're focused on a lot of different jurisdictions. Obviously, we're focused in places that a lot of us are. So, you know, we have, you know, uh, like our... Our programs where we have enforcement agreements and uh, assignment agreements, like for the Linux kernel and for Debian, we um, we obviously work with lawyers in those places too. So we have, um, you know, a European agreement 
um, for assignment. Now, we are a US entity, so it means that to the extent that we're taking copyrights from developers, we're going to hold them in the US because we are in the US. But we have function um, abroad. We function everywhere. And, um, and you know, we, we, for example, don't have any South African lawyers who we've been working with. But, um, but whenever there's a place where someone is very interested in and there's enough of an interest that it would be worth the expenditure, we, we look to experts from those places. And I think that you simply can't just think about the US. Um, however, I think these, uh, it's interesting is that a lot of the, for better or for worse, a lot of the countries have followed the U.S. in a lot of policy, and often that's for worse. Um, in many places, the patents regimes have followed the U.S., um, and I think a lot of the, um, the charitable structures as well. And so, you know, most of the, from what, and, and for example, the Food and Drug Administration's review in the US over my medical device. I used to, when I gave a talk, the medical devices talk, I would do a lot of research into the local um, places, Food and Drug Administration and review processes. But every place I went to, it was the same. They didn't review the software. They didn't. So th there's most of the, the, the big ideological issues are the same from place to place. And for the details, we work with partners. Phil? Uh, when you were talking about, uh, when you were talking about, uh, retaining copyright. Uh, we were, I was, a company I was working for was uh, uh, doing some work for a phone manufacturer in 2000. The idea of retaining copyright really wasn't happening. So uh, as a fallback position, we suggested to them that if we were modifying existing projects that were under copy left licenses, obviously we would have to comply with those licenses and that we would like to uh, retain copyright in that instance, and they went for that. And then, once you've got an agreement like that, it's not so difficult to persuade someone to upload a project that hasn't got very much in it under a license, <laughs> and then fork it immediately. Early, <laughs> early is really important. Making these decisions early is so essential. You can you can never turn back the clock, and you'll never have as much power as the day that a company is trying to recruit you. Once they have decided to hire you, before they have actually entered into agreement with you, before you've come on staff, they never want to hire you as much as what is in that moment because they've gone through the whole search. They've decided you're the one for them. The pro process is over. They just want to get the paperwork done. And that's the time. And if you think, even though you may think that it'll blow up the deal, it, it won't. You can, you can always blame me. You can say, like, a lawyer, I, you know, a lawyer told me I need to do these things. And then they'll say, well, we never do that. Or, and you can gauge the interest. And if you're nice about it and not, you know, and not adversarial about it, then, you, then it's fine. Um, David has a question. I have a question from IRC. So, so Chetan writes from Mexico, I assume. Uh, Karen, what do you think about the latest Oracle and Google law fight about Java and the GPL? <laughs> uh, uh, I'm recording an outcast, Free as in Freedom, about the whole issue. It would take a long time to discuss it. Uh, so more to come on that. Is there any more questions? So echoing the thing about employment agreements, I mean, my experience in the UK um, I'm sure it's a similar elsewhere. Is companies will try, will just try things on. There'll be a whole load of things in most employment agreements that are strictly not enforceable and probably illegal in many jurisdictions, but they'll put them in anyway. You know, it's just a case of talking through it. You know, they're negotiations. They're not um, fixed. They're not fixed terms. You know, every employment every employment contract is different. It's entirely up to you to talk about it. I work for a company that self-identifies as an IP company, so I just scribbled out the thing <coughs> saying that they own everything I do, and it caused no hassle. It's not a problem. <laughs> yeah, people think that because they're given a, a contract and it looks very official yeah. that it's f fixed and there's no chance to, um, to edit it, but that's almost never true. Um, there are some companies who would rather walk away from employing you than editing their um, their employment agreement, but they're the exception rather than the rule. And so because a lot of companies will negotiate it, there's a lot of room there. And if it becomes more standard, if de more developers ask, more employees ask for edits to the um, employment contracts, and especially if they all ask for it in the same way, then um, you know, that if, 
it's generally true in contract negotiations that when you ask, when you negotiate with someone, you ask for way more than you want because you want to be able to come down. So often it's built into these contracts provisions that companies know they're willing to move from. And if you ask them to move on something else, they'll say, well, we can't move on that, but we have this other provision we could give you, we could give you, you know? And so chances are you're not getting the best deal that's already available to you if you haven't asked. Okay, so I think we should move on now because um, it's getting out of time. Karen will be around at EPCONF until mm -hmm. Thursday, I think. So talk to her if you have any more questions or comments. And um, we are reconvening <coughs> about 10 minutes with a billion people and even more phones by Kathina Krishnan. Thank you.